For our last session, we've invited three of our speakers back to share their vision of how diagnosis, nutritional advice, treatments and care could change in the future and that have an impact on outcomes in scleroderma. In this interactive session, as well as your questions, we would like to hear about your hopes and dreams for the future of scleroderma. Please share these in the Zoom Q&A. And after our speakers have shared their vision, we'll have a discussion. Welcome back, Dr. Elizabeth Volkman and Professors Francesco Delgado and Chris Denton. Thank you. Thank you, um, Emma, and um, welcome back to, to, to all the participants. We see that we see more than 70 people, which is great. Um, I, I was very, very uh, thrilled by the title of this last session, Jump Starting 20 Years Ahead. And, and um, uh, historically, every time you try to, to go so, so much ahead, you miserably uh, fail in some aspects because because you you underestimate some and you maybe you overestimate some others. Um, so I was asked to to start and 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 chat really. This this is a sort of an informal session of what I think um, uh, we will be in twenty years. And inevitably, I think it's it's going to be what I hope and um, and what I hope it could be achievable, yeah? and rather than what I think. So. So this is recorded. So in 20 years, we will go back and maybe we will laugh <laughs> what we're saying. But, uh, so the, the first aspect is, is every diagnosis and, and it's something that is very close to me because one of the few things we have learned in, in scleroderma is that the, the tissue damage that is caused um, because of, of this autoimmune activation in scleroderma, it's, it's poorly reversible. So, so once it happens, the, the, the organs are affected in a way that do not go back completely to normal. So um, prevention is, is, is the best um, option for most uh, conditions. And But when there is an irreversible damage, perhaps it becomes extremely important to prevent that uh, the, uh, irreversible damage. So I, and there is a lot of research that started two years ago and is, is gaining uh, a big momentum in early detection of, of, of scleroderma. This is not an easy task because um, uh, it's, it's hard to detect when really um, scleroderma is um, um, happening and is starting to cause damage, um, but we're getting better at it, and we and we have a great opportunity, which is in a symptom that is is in the vast majority of cases the first thing happening is scleroderma, which is very old. So uh, and this happened several years before scleroderma, and the research that is happening, and I hope and I think will lead to some major discoveries in, in the next 20 years, is that we will be able, once Reino happens, and in people with Reino, to detect their risk, maybe with polygenetic scores, with, with, with simple tests, like not much different than pregnancy tests or this COVID test that we do, to see whether there is already a higher risk of having scleroderma. And after, as a first layer, and as a second layer, in these people that we know they have a higher risk, to see when this condition starts to brew under the skin before the skin becomes affected. And at that stage, when we have that this biological diagnosis of scleroderma before any clinical symptoms, then will be the rest of us that will have opportunity of, of prevent tissue damage. So, so I think in 20 years, I want to be there. Um, I, I hope I will see that. I'm working to see that. And um, I, I think this is an achievable target. Um, and with that, it is, I think we will shift the concept of, of diagnosis. There will be a different level of diagnosis, the diagnosis of a risk, and then there will be the diagnosis of a biological activity, and then there will be the clinical diagnosis, which is the diagnosis we do today. So what we call scleroderma today will be just the third layer, the late diagnosis of scleroderma. That's my vision. Okay, wonderful. 
Uh, well, I'm delighted to be here today. And um, I think that my vision for the future really follows um, very nicely what Professor Delgado recommended. So he talked about being able to diagnose patients at a very early stage, perhaps even before the disease starts to progress or before symptoms start. And I think my vision is going the, the next step further, trying to be able to predict what organs may be involved in the future for patients with scleroderma. So let's say you were able to get this early diagnosis or this increased likelihood of getting scleroderma, we could test your blood sample or your stool sample and be able to analyze it and look at those results and tell you what the likelihood is of you developing pulmonary fibrosis or pulmonary hypertension or GI involvement. And I think that if we can do this, it will be helpful in a few ways. One of the ways is that, as many of you know, when you receive this diagnosis, it can be very scary and there's a lot of unknown, like, am I going to develop pulmonary fibrosis? Will I end up needing supplemental nutrition down the line? We would be able, with this testing, to be able to tell you what your likelihood is of developing certain complications of scleroderma. And then once we knew that information, we could from the beginning start to tailor your treatment to try to prevent those organs from becoming involved. And this might involve telling you to take a certain medication, um, telling you how to modify your diet in a certain way, but we would basically be working to try to prevent the disease from progressing. Um, because again, every patient with this illness is very unique. So we can't apply one treatment for every patient. Um, and I think that this is, is possible. Um, you know, a lot has changed in scleroderma even over the last 10 years. And when I first started training in this area, I trained under two individuals who are, again, much older than, than all of us. And when they cared for patients with scleroderma, they didn't have really any treatment options for them or the ones that they used were from, you know, treating other diseases and they didn't even know if they were helpful in scleroderma. Now, you know, 10 years later, we have a lot of options for patients and we have a lot of interest in discovering new treatments. So I think that uh, the vision that Professor Dragado outlaid and mine as well is definitely something that we could accomplish in 20 years time. Thank you, Elizabeth and, and Francesco. Um, so uh, it, it's great to, to really follow your comments about the future. And I just wanted to give my perspective. And I think that um, one of the things is that if we think about 20 years, it is a meaningful um, time frame to think about treatment progression, because as I showed in my talk, that we moved in 20 years from 2001, when we had the first tablet therapy for pulmonary arterial hypertension, 20 years later, we've got really comprehensive evidence now that the combination of different drugs for pulmonary hypertension really have transformed outcomes for, for our scleroderma patients and other patients with that disease. So, so it, it does tell us that we can sort of make progress, but it takes probably 20 years to go from having promising drugs or drugs that maybe work in isolation to knowing how to use those drugs effectively in combination. So I think that we will see progress with the drugs we have now and also with the drugs that are in, in the pipeline. And one of my visions, I suppose, is that we all know that stem cell transplantation can be a very, very effective treatment for some patients with steroidoma, but it's also a very, very difficult treatment for patients and a difficult treatment to give. And it may be that as in other areas of medicine, as we look 20 years ahead, maybe we will be thinking less about treatments like stem cell transplantation and much more about using combinations of more targeted therapies to achieve the same treatment impact that we that we know is possible. So that, that was a thought about treatment. Um, I think there will also be a much more of a precision medicine approach, um, as Elizabeth was suggesting. In future a little bit at early stage of making the diagnosis and, and then sort of target our treatments um, in, in, individually. So that was one thought about treatments for the future. The other was my thoughts about the patient journey with scleroderma. And I think that's where, you know, it's exciting to think about technologies and, and, and the um, things that are, uh, are developing, because I think that more and more we will, uh, and we've perhaps learned in the pandemic, we're able to do more remotely. And I think that that's an exciting idea. Um, being able to do more remote assessments. There are already some research to 
uh, look at how we might assess the heart or the lung remotely. We're um, undertaking work supported by SRUK to try and um, get patients to assess their skin more at home uh, in a way that we've had to during the COVID-19 pandemic, but in a way that might we might move into clinical practice. So I think perhaps envisaging a time where instead of just seeing our patients every six months or every 12 months and doing tests, we can have a sort of approach that we might have with our, um, with our traditional car, for example, where we have monitoring that tells us when you need a test or when you need an investigation or, or, or a treatment. So that was a sort of vision. But I think, as Francesco said, this is being recorded. And I'm very mindful, and I am of the age that I can remember the very popular television series, Tomorrow's World, um, which used to come on every day, probably 30 or more years ago uh, in the UK. And I think it was um, every week they would be predicting what we would have in you know the future, hover cars or pills that would replace meals and that sort of thing. And I think it was a commentary afterwards um, recently that I don't think any of the predictions that were made on that Tomorrow's World program ever actually came true. So I think we will have to see. I, I think we can be a little bit more optimistic than that um, for, for scleroderma, but I'll be very happy to sort of have more discussion and see if, um, if Emma or, or uh, delegates got questions. to um, <laughs> Professor Delgado, Professor Denton, and Dr. Volkman sharing their vision. Um, that's really, some really interesting ideas and concepts, and I'm keen to get some discussion among the delegates and ourselves. Um, so I, I, I'll kick off. I have a question, um, and I suppose it's, it's linked to, to the concept that uh, Professor Delgado introduced, which is about the idea of future screening for risk of scleroderma. Um, and I was wondering whether there could be future blood-based screening tests and whether, you know, it would be for, well, not just scleroderma, autoimmune conditions, related conditions, including related conditions, and whether these could be perhaps um, deployed in sort of things like routine midlife um, NHS over 40s health check to actually try and pinpoint somebody who has perhaps a genetic risk and is perhaps starting to move towards that profile a little bit earlier. Yes, um, thank you. Thank you for the for the question. I think um, mindful of what, of what this just said, first of all, um, it wouldn't be great if in 20 years SIUK would play back these videos um, to the to the three of us. Um, and um, and we start from there. Uh, so that could be a good idea. This is, is recorded. Besides the little that uh, happened before, maybe you can cuddle in a way that is only one session. <laughs> I'm extremely, extremely intrigued to, to uh, see what I will call the young me in 20 years and, um, and, and see where we were. And yes, I think um, uh, that is a possibility. And we all, all oh, we can wear watches now that are tracking our steps, are tracking our heart rate, and our and we things that 20 years ago we weren't thinking were possible. So I I envisage as as uh, Chris was saying that we will have wearables, wearables that are, are there'll be monitors like they are included in, in our cars as Chris was saying. And they will be monitoring our health continuously or more or less continuously. We are already working uh, on, on this project with uh, engineers uh, in London and uh, it's possible. So um, have you seen and, and, and perhaps some of you have noticed the way uh, diabetes care has changed and, and uh, where, where my um, grandfather uh, realize it was diabetic. He needed to go and check his glucose level to go to, have to, go to his doctor to do that. And then uh, he started to have this great pin prick uh, device at home where he can just prick his finger and say, okay, I'm doing okay today. And now there is this Bluetooth monitor continuously that can measure. So, so medicine is going that way and we will have a monitor, uh, maybe on our wrist or who knows where they want to uh, go too far because otherwise we will laugh too much in 20 years but we will have a monitor that 
that will be progressively telling us more and more. And hopefully you can tell us your, have, your immune system is starting to be a bit um, deregulated, too active, it's, and, and, and there's something you need to do now or some check that you need to do. So that's where I see the diagnosis and monitoring going. A question. Oh, sorry, Professor. No, I was just going to. I, I was just going to also say uh, my comments or thoughts about this sort of uh, you know testing for early diagnosis. I think one of the things though that we just need to bear in mind is that a lot of the um, uh, the features that we've learned from our genetic studies, for example, are that that you can get a sort of you can identify uh, factors that may make you at risk of a an autoimmune disease, for example, but not necessarily telling us that you might be at risk of scleroderma specifically. And I think that that really comes back to some of the things that, that Dr. Volkman was also saying in her talk today, that I think it's going that there will be probably, I think, much more opportunity potentially to identify risks that are more general to health and ways of modifying lifestyle and trying to maybe even get to the stage of trying to prevent or minimize the, the risk of developing a disease because um, I, I personally think that you know it is challenging to think about having tests for every specific rare disease when you don't really you know when you're not sure what you might be at risk for but to know whether you had a high or a low risk I think that's something that it would be probably much more useful and, and as, as um, Elizabeth was suggesting you know, if you could modify your diet or do things for your lifestyle that could be enormously helpful um, I think. Yeah, and I think over time we may be able to identify more of these environmental triggers. There's been, you know, some research in this area, but we see where there are some, I take care of some families where there's a couple of people that have scleroderma, uh, first degree relatives, but I would say this is pretty rare. And so there's obviously things happening in the environment, even in identical twins where one twin gets the scleroderma and the other doesn't, they have the same genetic material. So I think hopefully our research will illuminate other environmental factors, whether it's diet or pollutants or any kind of exposures. And then in those at-risk patients, we may be able to tell them, okay, you need to limit your consumption of this or um, try to live in a, a, an area where you're not around these environmental exposures. Yeah, I love the concept. Lisa. And, and this, uh, I've seen now my my, young daughter that learned how to read the color-coded uh, content of food and uh, when it's green, when it's yellow, and when it's red, and which is great, these things that were not around when I was a kid. Um, and I think what we eat and what we introduce in our bodies can, uh, can make surely some difference and we'll be able to turn a lot more things there, not just the percent of fat, or a percent of carbs, but perhaps we'll be able to tailor what we can eat with a much more complex color-coded system and, and, um, and having this suggestion, maybe directly from the device we're wearing. So I think the possibilities are endless, really. Thank you. So we have a question from a lady called Isabel in the audience. Um, and she's, she's raised the question about how uh, when people are diagnosed with scleroderma, they typically encounter um, doctors who know relatively nothing about the condition. How do you think education for, um, for your colleagues might change over the future, in the future, so we can raise awareness? I think this is a, a great question and um, I can share the experience of working in the United States that might be different in the UK, but um, I often see patients after they've been to sometimes three or four other doctors before a diagnosis is made. And I think it can be really frustrating for patients because not only does it delay their diagnosis, but it delays their treatment and that can affect their health uh, long-term. Um, I think it's our responsibility as specialists to really make education one of our core missions. And I think that through the technology that we've kind of talked about today, this is 
more possible than ever. You know, there's no way for us to educate every rheumatologist out there on scleroderma, but through these kind of like Zoom webinars that make the education really accessible where people can log in from their computer at home, they don't have to travel to a meeting or pay for an extra seminar, they can just go online and be able to get this information. I think um, it would be really helpful. What do you guys uh, think about this? <laughs> so Liz, I, I very much agree. And of course, I think we're all, all of us, we know from various conferences and these meetings that we're very in, invested in education. It is very important. I mean, there is a challenge because scleroderma is a rare disease and therefore unless you're specialized in the condition you probably won't see many patients and, and it's inevitable that you won't have all of the expertise so I think it's important and as you say to 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 sort of make sure that expertise and advice is available I guess I would also like to make the point that I, I think one of the biggest changes I've also seen in the last 20 years probably is the level of knowledge that patients often have when they come to the clinic and I can remember uh, you know, early in my career, you would very often, when a patient came and they'd been given the label as possibly having scleroderma, you'd spend the first part of the consultation explaining what scleroderma was. And I would often commented that more recently, I think in the age of Google and the internet, we often also have to now spend a lot of time telling patients what scleroderma isn't because, you know, they've, um, they've sort of learned a lot about things uh, online that may or may not be relevant to them. And I think that's just really emphasizes that it's not just about having access to the information, but sort of having high quality information. And, and I guess it's really good to be talking to an audience like uh, SIUK today that um, you know, it's really important that patients have high quality information so that they can get the right information to, 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 to learn about the disease. And uh, because I think it's inevitable that often patients become more expert than some of their doctors um, in terms of, um, of the disease. So um, I think that's, and, and that's something I, I, I'm sure will continue. Francesco, I'm not sure. Uh, thank you. I, I agree. I agree completely. Um, the, the, the level of information and hopefully the, the level of, of gatekeeping and check that we can go on the information that is around um, will, will make the, um, our lives uh, easier and the lives of our patients easier. The, because with the great deal of information that is available to us now, there is also a great risk of misinformation. So, so that is surely something we need to work a lot on. Uh, um, if, if I can continue on the, on the, on the vision, and um, I, I picked up what, what you were saying about rare diseases, um, perhaps this is something that will change. Perhaps, perhaps we will realize that, that scleroderma, it is a rare uh, type of manifestation of a immune system issue. And so we would, would become more part of a group of diseases that we will treat maybe at, at source. So there is, there is the possibility, like, like um, we've seen in the research with cancer, that we will understand common mechanisms of, of immune-mediated diseases. Where, where the, the scleroderma, as we know today, would be the clinical manifestation, very late and uh, manifestation of something of the immune system we would be able to detect a lot earlier. So instead of a rare disease, would be a rare manifestation of a, another disease that we would call it the mm. autoimmunity. And that is, is, is something that I think carry a very high potential because we'll be able to, to treat group of conditions that are similar from the biological point of view and then eventually give different clinical symptoms. I have a, a hope from Estelle, which is perhaps linked to this morning's quest, um, session on data. And Estelle is talking about her hope for the future is that all health providers work together or work better together. She says that at the moment she feels like she needs to share any changes made by one with all the other specialists and health providers that she sees, which is obviously quite stressful, especially when it involves medication. How do you think information sharing could change in the future? Oh, I will, I will, I will start with this. It's, it's, this is this topic is very close to me because I, I share how frustrating it might be 
for a patient to tell one doctor what the other doctor has been saying. And um, I think we finally have the tools now for patients to carry their own information and to communicate it to us, maybe to an app or to a chief. So, so that, that we, when I see a patient, I'll be able to see everything that every other doctor has ever said about that patient without having to rely on, on letters that sometimes arrive, on, on, on facts, which already we don't do anymore. <laughs> And um, so I, I see there is a great potential in mobile apps in any sort of data storage the patient can bring with them and share with the doctor, but they'll give your health fingerprint and whatever. So every consultation, every lab test that you ever done will travel with you, maybe on a chip, and, and your doctor will be able to see it. So, so at the moment, uh, we are in the prehistory of that, but we are building all the blocks for that to happen. So I hold a strong hope for that. Elizabeth, I would be very interested to know if, uh, if in Los Angeles you have um, uh, how how it works in terms of your patients and your electronic uh, communications between physicians. Is it, 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 have you made a lot of progress there? Yeah, we have a, a really wonderful system for this where um, it's very easy to communicate with other providers, not only within your institution, but also any um, hospital system in the country that uses the same kind of computer program, you can also see their records too. Um, so it's probably not quite as good as what, what you have, but <laughs> we're getting there. But what I will say to speak to this point is that uh, when I started out, I found that a lot of patients um, had difficulty because one, one of their specialists, their rheumatologist may say one thing, and then maybe their pulmonologist says something different, and then they feel confused because they're getting two different sort of suggestions. And then they realize that those two doctors aren't speaking to one another. So what we've created is sort of multidisciplinary teams for caring for patients with scleroderma where we actually meet as a group to discuss the care for, for the patients we see. And I think that this is something that doesn't have to just happen at an academic center, but it could actually happen even in a community setting through something like Zoom, where you know once a week a rheumatologist may log on to a meeting with the pulmonologist that's also in that town and go through the, the cases that they see. So I think that multidisciplinary discussion. It's, it's happening now, but I think it could happen on a much broader scale if we utilize uh, technology. Thank you. I, I agree. And, and of course, you know, we're having similar models of care with, with multidisciplinary team-based um, you know, management of our patients. But I think, you know, in a, uh, like many things, like the, the conference we're having today, it's been one of those things that actually the, the pandemic has sort of accelerated. And I think it's in some ways improved that team-based management of, of complex patients, as you say, because you can at least bring multiple special specialists together. Um, and I, and I, I would, uh, I, I actually would have thought you're probably, you you may be a little bit ahead of us in our, in your electronic communication and, um, uh, and integration of, of notes. And I say that because we, uh, in our hospital, are just upgrading our electronic patient record. Um, uh, and I know that all of those up, those systems that, are, that, that we're using in, in the NHS and really have, have been, I think, developed and tested in the, in the United States. So I think it's, um, you know, it is a, a very important point about having um, good integration. And according to the, uh, the, educate, the training we're having for this new system, which comes live, I think, next month, um, uh, you know, we will start to be able to then see input from all of the healthcare providers for a patient you know, across, the, across the NHS, which would be wonderful. But um, we will just have to see, of course, it, it, um, not everything that is promised is delivered, as we know, with, um, with these <laughs> yeah. IT systems. Yeah, yeah. There, is, there, there is a great potential. The, the city of, of Leeds uh, championed that uh, um, two years ago. And so and it took a big deal of effort, but we have this one system which is called the Leeds Care Record. So, so, so now uh, I'm able to to see all the community access, the GP, the, the GP, and every other specialist, and all the images taken in the region for each of our patients, which is great. And it, but it's, it's still not 
complete because that doesn't include other hospital admission in other hospitals. But at least mm -hmm. we can see everything the GP can see and we can see every other um, consultant letters that, that the patient has with it. Uh, it is still primordial though, because there is a lot of information that I don't need and there is a lot of sifting through uh, uh, all medications, all history. And so, so there will be surely a great deal of development in this area. So I want to hold the hope for this patient up. Um, there'll be less and less need to have another doctor told me that. Um, I have a question from Linda, who um, lives in an area where um, local care isn't as specialised as in some centres within the UK. Um, and he asks, well, I think he's wondering about how we can sort of end the force code lottery. So to add on to that, do you think technology and the techno technological changes that Professor Benton's described could actually help end um, the postcode lottery that we sometimes see in this country. I, I, I think it's um, it, it is challenging, and of course, you know, we, we as a sort of centre that sees patients from all uh, all across the sort of the south of, of, of uh, England and, and into Wales, we are very much aware that there is, is a, a variability in the in the sort of uh, access and and. Um, uh, that patients have to specialise services. I think that um, uh, it is a challenge, but it is something I think that the NHS is aware of, and I think it's always had a, a priority over the last few years to try and reduce this sort of uh, uneven access. But um, uh, and, and I think there is potential um, for, for sort of uh, better communication and um, uh, to help with that. But um, uh, it certainly is is an important issue. I don't know. Um, I think Francesco, you have been operating a system where you've sort of been a a, a centre that has a lot of links with other hospitals um, around Leeds and the north of England. So you probably have a, a, a sort of perspective on on that. Yes, I do. Uh, um, I think people will always always be free to choose where they want to live when they can, and 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 especially centres. Where above all for conditions like scleroderma cannot be in every town. So, so the distance, the physical distance from 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 a centre will always be a factor. But we are we will be able to need less and less physical interaction for most of our diagnostic tests. So while there will always be an element of travel to go and see the doctor that you want to see the harmonization of care. If you have these symptoms, these are the tests that you have to do. And probably you can do it more or less close to your house if it's a blood test or if it's an imaging test. And that those tests can be interpreted in the center of excellence or in the reference center. And so the communication with remote part or with small towns uh, it's already improved a lot. During this lockdown, I've been able to see through the video um, our patients that were in remote places. And, um, and besides the, the skills of, of patients in, 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 in video and show me maybe an ulcer on their finger, and, but that was something that I would have never thought it would. It could happen, and we could do it from an NHS setting. So, yes, there is this post-code lottery of care, which is inevitably driven by the fact that there are centers with more um, um, knowledge in, in rare diseases than others. But the the awareness that Liz was mentioning, the education of every doctor in every corner of the world about what it should be done. In, in some cases, we at least harmonize the approaches, right? And then, so that a patient that lives in London will have the same tests or will have the same information about the test she needs that a patient that lives in a small little town in the north of Scotland. And, and so that is, that is what I think is gonna happen. Yeah, I'm curious. So during your lockdown, did you do telehealth appointments with your patients through video? Yes. Yeah. 
Yes. Yeah. So it was, it, it took uh, three months, uh, but by July, we were able to invite by a text message through, right. a, through a link to a, a application that didn't know it could work that way. But but patients were clicking on the on the message and they were allowing the camera of the phone to work and I was seeing right. on my screen and they were seeing me. So yeah. and I think this is one of the healthcare benefits of of the lockdown, where we sort of started to drive this innovation and more. More than innovation, because the system was then it was not invented because of the lockdown, but it's been the governance the, that has accepted this as a system. This was unacceptable before. And now I have patients that are booked for an appointment, and there are some patients that are two or three hours away, and they send a message to say, I feel okay, I think it would be enough to have a video consultation if you're okay, doctor. And we accept that. And so they keep their slot, and instead of physically driving, we have a video consultation. Uh, that's not ideal because there is always an element of physical exam that we need to do. Um, but I think with the aid of, of blood tests and imaging tests, we'd be able to stratify who really needs to be seen in person and who can have a quick chat about the symptom or just a blood test. And in the uh, in, uh, United States, and uh, are you doing video consultations with this? Yes, yeah, we started it during the pandemic, probably around the same time, and the system works, you know, excellent. And I have a lot of patients who don't even live in California, they live in other states and haven't been able to, to fly or travel, and for them it's been wonderful. So I definitely think telehealth can be helpful for patients that live in more remote areas where it's just difficult to get to a leading center. I, I also agree, though, it's not the same as seeing someone in person. Um, so I think it would still be good for even if you live in a remote area to try at least once a year to get in, an in-person visit, because I think that as a physician, there's a certain feeling you get when you see someone in person that might be different than when you see them through the computer, particularly because you're only seeing this part up usually. <laughs> um, but I, I do think it's uh, it's a great way to connect with people that might not be able to physically travel. Um, and I have patients now who do it who, you know, maybe not feel well that day and instead of missing their appointment entirely, they can do it from home. So, um, yeah. Think about it, and if we're a bit bored now and thinking it fast forward 20 years, which what we wanted to do now. And from the video consultation that is happening today, you have this little probe that you take from your camera and you attach, and you can see the lungs and you can measure yeah. the oxygen and you can see the heart, how it beats, and you can have a portable echo. And all <laughs> so you only you, you see the face in the video like you were doing 20 years ago. <laughs> And now looking at everything else, you can see right. the of, of the of of the uh, of your immune system. You it, uh, because you prick a finger and then the test happens. It could happen. It could happen. So they could be the only thing. Yes, that the stethoscope. You have this this stethoscopes now that that are connected to your iPhone. So you can have this little thing that you touch and you be. <laughs> to hear it hear. So, so yeah i think there will be a lot more telemedicine in 20 years and we what and we were laughing at the time we could just see this part up <laughs> of the, see inside we will have to see their bloods and their lungs so that's it's a very interesting 20 years yeah. Of course, Francesco, if you were to take that, maybe not 20 years, maybe 40 years, maybe we wouldn't be needed at all because artificial intelligence and the, uh, would be able to actually do the management as well as, uh, yeah. <laughs> as, as to diagnose uh, the, the problem. But I think being more serious, I think as, as Liz said, that it's been a real um, a benefit to our patients who are a long way away from the, from the clinic. And, and in particular, it's also been a situation where we've really appreciated our local rheumatology colleagues. We always have a, a shared care model for our patients that, that have a local rheumatologist who may be less of a scleroderma specialist, but will be very involved. And, and those local colleagues and, and, and teams have become more important, I think, if we, if we are going to do this sort of more telemedicine. But um, certainly we're at a stage now where about half of our patients are still having video consultations, um, but those that need to come, of course, can 
can come to the clinic. But uh, well, yeah. I, I, you pick up with this artificial intelligence, I, of course, it's there to make us retire happily. And um, sometimes it's the it's the opinion. I would choose your opinion, Chris, over any artificial intelligence anytime. Uh. <laughs> it is a decision and it's an algorithm that artificial intelligence will do, but then there will always be a choice and there will always be an opinion on weighing the choice. So uh, we'll be busy, we'll still be busy if, if AI will go ahead. <laughs> I think now is probably a good time to stop. Thank you all for sharing your vision and for this great discussion. I think in answer to the point made about whether you'll still be needed in 40 years time, one of our um, attendees has actually asked whether you could all be cloned for the devolved nations oh. and says you've all been great. <laughs> um, so with that in mind, thank you once again. It's been a pleasure hosting this session. I'm now going to hand over to Sue, who's going to close the conference. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. So thanks, Emma. And it has been really fascinating to hear our speakers sort of hopes and visions for the future, as well as the thoughts of our community. So as Emma said, that brings us to the end of the conference. And I just want to say thank you to everybody who's joined us and participated. You've given us great questions. Um, thank you for your patience with our technical glitch. Um, true scleroderma and Reno's community spirit. Um, I hope you found it informative and that you take away something that perhaps you didn't know previously. I think we are very, very lucky um, that our community of clinicians and researchers within the field of scleroderma and, and Raynaud's are so dedicated and so passionate. And so I want to say a very, very big thank you to all of our expert speakers today for sharing their knowledge and wisdom, but also giving up their time um, on a Saturday. Very, very much appreciated because I know that the last 18 months for you guys has been pretty grueling. So yeah, very, very much appreciated. I want to thank our sponsors for their support and the exhibitors. And to say thank you to those people behind the scenes, as well as the SOUK staff who've been involved in planning and delivering this event today. And I've got a final plea, please complete the survey. Your feedback is so important to help us improve, to help us um, shape the next conference, which will be in 2022. And I seriously hope is gonna be face to face. I've seen some comments in the chat about you know, really, yes, you can connect on chat, but there's nothing can substitute that face to face. Although I think we probably will still have an online element to make it as inclusive as possible. So very, very big thanks to everybody and really enjoy the rest of your day and goodbye.